Hi, today we're going to be looking at the Axe Solder soldering station and this was sent to me by Axel uh, I think at the end of November last year so I do apologise for the delay in the video but this is designed to be the answer to driving JBC soldering irons so um, the whole design is published on GitHub and we can have a quick look on there first of all now. So here it is on GitHub and I'll put a link to this in the description down below. It's designed to drive JBC, C115, C210 and C245 type cartridges and you can build it in two different formats. Either the portable format which is the version that I've been sent or you can build a slightly different one and if you have a JBC cradle you can make it into a more permanent fixture on your workbench. Uh, and that might suit the type of person that wants this as a proper soldering station rather than something more portable. It's based around the same PCB for both designs uh, and we can have a look at the schematic in a moment but here is the PCB. So it's got a 240 by 320 TFT on the front here which has a nice graphical display. Uh, we've got a couple of buttons and an encoder but there is a version now where it just has three buttons if you don't want the encoder. And then you can see all of the components on the back side of the PCB, including a USB-C power delivery port. But you can also power this from a DC supply as well. And then he's got various versions of the firmware. As you can see, it's had regular updates for quite a while now. And then this is what the finished system looks like. And you can buy this on Axel's Tindy store, as you can see here, for $145 with the PCB fully populated. Or you can buy the PCB on its own uh, for just $10. Alternatively, you can go and get this made at a sponsor for this video, PCB Way. And I often mention PCB Way's shared project area. And this is a great example where Axel has uploaded this to the PCB Way shared projects area. Again, I'll put a link to this in the description down below. But you can either get the PCB made on its own or you can do PCB and assembly and this takes all the hard work of uploading the billing materials and sorting out the pick and place. Simply click on the PCB and assembly option and click add to cart and Axel has already done all the hard work in the background for you so you can just simply place an order for the project. We've also got the mechanical CAD so depending on which version you want to build either the portable or the version for the stand you can click on the correct folder and then we've got all of the CAD files on here. And you can either print these at home on your 3D printer or again we can go to PCB Way, click on 3D printing and they have very competitive rates for the 3D printing. So just drag and drop the files from the GitHub onto here, pick the colour and material and then you can get it made by PCBWay.com. So the station is compatible with genuine JBC hand pieces or the Chinese ones. If it's a genuine JBC you may need to change the connector on the end of the handpiece and you may need to add a link cable depending on which handpiece you're using so that the station knows which handpiece is connected uh, but this can either plug into here or if you build the stand version then it plugs into the back of a stand and then you use the handpiece supplied with the JBC cradle. On this end we've got some DC connectors so if you want to power it from a battery pack or some other DC supply you can give it the supply voltage into these two terminals here and then we've also got an earth terminal for connecting to the protective earth so that the end of the cartridge is earthed. We've got a little section here which on the portable version is designed for the handpiece to sit there and when it's in place on this little metal part it'll put it into sleep mode and then on the front obviously we've got the TFT and you can in the menu choose between landscape and portrait modes You've got the encoder for changing the temperature and then a couple of push buttons here for presets. And then just on the bottom here, we've got a USB-C connector. Once again, the GitHub is the place to go for all of the details for if you build your own. It's got all the wiring diagrams and the pinouts for the various connectors. Also some suggestions on power supplies should you wish to use an external power supply rather than a DC power pack or a USB connector. And then we've got some details on how to make the adjustment to the connector depending on which handpiece version you're using. And the idea here is that the axe solder station can then detect which um, handpiece you've got connected to it and then adjust the power levels uh, depending on which cartridge you're using. We've also got some guides for updating the firmware which you can either do using the USB connector or you can do it using the SWD interface and there's some steps here for using the ST-Link and then we've got the details of the settings that are in the menu. Here's the schematic and overall it makes a lot of sense. I probably would have laid it out over two pages. I understand why it's done this way 
But to make it a little bit clearer how it all works, it would have been nice to have the power architecture on one and then some of the digital electronics on the other page. So what we've got is the terminal block on the, bo on the back of the PCB in this block here. And we get our VDD in through a fuse and then onto VDD. And that feeds either the iron. So we've got a high side gate driver and then channel MOSFET. And VDD is feeding that and that's what powers the soldering iron. And VDD also goes to this 7.5 volt switching regulator, which then drops down to 3.3 through the LDO and is used as 7.5 volts elsewhere in the schematic. The other option is using the USB-C power delivery. So we've got a USB-C connector here. We've got a chip handling the power delivery. And then we've got a switch here, which is used to switch between the external power and the power coming from the USB port. So that's where, what this little chip over here does. Over here we've got the STM32 and that is driving a little loudspeaker. We've got the inputs from the switches and the encoder and then that's also driving the gate driver. And then at the top left here we've got some analog electronics here. One of them being used for current feedback and one for measuring the thermocouple. And this is just where I spotted a couple of mistakes here. So what we've got is a relatively high speed chopper stabilised op amp just here. I think it's a 5 megahertz part. And because we've got quite a bit of gain this circuit inherently is going to be quite susceptible to noise and what we want to do is we typically put a capacitor in parallel with the feedback resistor here to roll off the frequency at a point that's suitable for the design but that prevents any oscillations occurring from nearby noise sources. And then the other problem that we've got which is a little bit more serious is we've got a capacitor just here on the output of an op amp and typically you would never drive a capacitive load with an op amp if you can help it. Uh, what can happen is you can get what's called gain peaking at some high frequency just before the frequency rolls off of this amplifier and that can effectively cause an inversion in the phase and lead to you getting positive feedback in the feedback resistor just here and then it causes oscillations and uncontrolled behavior of the op amp. So uh, two things there that we'd want to resolve uh, one way to resolve this capacitor just here is to put a small series resistor in series with the capacitor and that will decouple the capacitor from here. I think the only reason the capacitor is here is just to distribute charge when we do an ADC reading so that we've got uh, that voltage stored in that capacitor but really it's not needed. You should be fine just driving the output of the op amp directly into the ADC or as I said just adding an RC filter just there. So I think this is due a firmware upgrade, but we'll just have a quick look at the operation first. So we've got a Ugreen 300 watt USB-C power supply connected to this, and it's negotiated a 20 volt supply here. It says we've got 100 watts available into the handle type T245. Now, I haven't actually got the handpiece connected, but when none of the pins are bridged on the connector, it means it's the T245, which we've got here. We've got a little bar graph. At the moment it's in sleep, but you can see at the bottom it'd be 0 watts and at the top it'd be 100 watts. We've got the microcontroller temperature, the power source, which at the moment is USB, and then we've got the set point temperature, which we can quickly adjust by turning the rotary encoder, or we can use some presets. So we can press the preset here and it sets it to 330 or 430. Now there is a menu and that's where you set the presets. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have the long press, which I think would be a good feature whereby if you hold this here, then it would store it in memory. Instead, what we have to do is unplug the USB connector, press the rotary encoder, and then plug it in. So the first option here is the startup temperature, which is always 330. Now, I think in one of the later firmware versions, it keeps it uh, based on what was previously set, which I think is a good idea. We've got temperature offset, which is part of the calibration. You've got standby temperature and standby time. So there's two ways in which this works. If you place the handpiece on the little bit of metal here, if you put it back in the cradle, then it will go to the standby temperature, but also just after 10 minutes of it not being uh, on either of these two things, then it will drop to 150 degrees. We've got the sleep time. So after 30 minutes in this case, it will shut the cartridge off. Uh, we've got the buzzer which we can turn on or off uh, now it uses one or zero which is fine for us electronics and programming type people but that might be nice if it said on or off instead and we've got we've got our presets here so uh, preset temperature one and preset two now i'm not going to set it to 430 let's set it to uh, something more like 36 360 
then we've got uh, GPIO 4 on at run. So there is one pin on the PCB which you can use to trigger something like a extractor or something else. So every time the Soldier 9 is active, then it will turn the output on and you could use it to drive something, which is quite nice. Uh, screen screen rotation, so there's a few options here. Depending on which one of these you choose uh, is, you know, one of each orientation here. And then we've got a power limit, should we wish to set one. The current measurement, which uh, allows us to have that bar graph and then a startup beep. Temperature in Celsius, so the other option presumably is Fahrenheit. And then we've got uh, multi-point calibration here. So if we wanted to check each temperature point, we could do that and store it and that would give us a nice curve. And then interesting is a serial debug and there is a an option here for us to stream data out the USB port and have a look at the profile of what's going on with the actual soldering cartridge and that can help with tuning the PID parameters. Then we've got the usual load default, save and reboot and exit with no save. So we've got firmware version 3.2.2 and there is a newer one so let's see if we can update that. The latest is 3.3.1, so we'll download the bin file. To enter DFU mode, we're going to hold this right hand button and plug in a USB lead that's connected to a PC. And then in STM32 Cube Programmer, we're going to select USB here and make sure that we found a USB device and click connect. And you can see that it's found the STM32 just here. Click on open file, go to the folder with our bin file that we just downloaded and click on open and then we can click on download just here. So let's check the firmware download was successful. We'll hold the encoder and plug in the USB port again. And yeah, you can see we've got firmware 3.3.1. So let's plug in the USB port once again and we've got a cartridge in the handpiece. And now we're reading the actual temperature as you can see. Now I'm a little bit puzzled why it says 100 watts here. This USB-C port is capable of 140 watts power delivery. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a limitation of the little chip that's being used on here or some other configuration detail. But 100 watts, if we heat up from cold, this is how long it takes. So you can see the bar graph there in blue. That could possibly be a, a lighter blue. But it takes several seconds there for it to heat up using the USB-C power supply. But once we're up to temperature, we can easily melt solder onto one of these gold pads. And you can see the power meter going up and down as we deliver power into the PCB. So if you have a look just there, when we put a blob of solder on this pad, you can see it's starting to heat up. And then it'll start to drop off again once we've reached temperature on the pad. Then there's two ways to put it back into the standby temperature. As mentioned before, we can either rest it on the little cradle there and it says standby, or you can just press the encoder and that will also put it into sleep mode as well. So we've made a DC power cable here, which will allow us to power this from an external 24 volt supply. So I'll plug that into there and that should allow us to deliver the full 130 watts into the cartridge. For some reason it's limiting at 100 watts for the power delivery. And we're reading 24.4 volts on the display. It's actually uh, 24 exactly on the power supply, so just a little bit of error there. But if we remove the solder 9 from the cradle, we should see how quick it heats up now. And a lot quicker. It's drawing about 5.5 amps from the 24 volt supply and then now it's dropped down uh, right down to about 500 milliamps or so. Uh, so that was significantly quicker being powered by an external power supply and as before we can melt solder absolutely fine onto some thick ground planes. Lots of power delivery there, no problem whatsoever. Let's plug the new one in. And it keeps it in sleep mode, that's why I didn't touch it with my hand, I wasn't sure if it would start heating up the moment it made contact. But it stays in sleep until we press the encoder or release it from the cradle, which is good. So we'll just place that in there a moment. And then we'll just do a quick unofficial coin test. Unofficial because I can't actually find the solder that I normally use for this test right now. 
Okay, and let's melt about 10 centimetres of solder onto the coin. We're about 75 watts at the moment. But yeah, lots of power being delivered in there, no problem whatsoever. So I think that's a really nice open source solution to using these JBC hand pieces and cartridges. I think Axel's done a great job of the hardware implementation. There's probably a few tweaks I'd make to the um, software. Firstly, I'd definitely have the ability to hold down the button and store the current set temperature on that preset. I think that's a lot easier than going through and power cycling into the settings menu. But I think also the settings menu I would allow access by just holding down the encoder or something like that rather than having to do that power cycle because some of those settings in there you may want to visit frequently. Um, now I think what I'm going to end up doing is getting PCB way to 3D print the other housing like this so that I can use it with the cradle. This is fine for portable use but what I did notice um, is it's very easy to accidentally brush the cable, knock this off the aluminium bit here and it starts heating it up. Now in mobile use that's fine because you can just use the encoder by pressing it to bring it in and out of sleep mode. But if you want to use the fast wake up, uh, this is a little bit flimsy on the workbench. You've got to be careful not to nudge the cable. So I think this will be a much more robust solution. And then we can put it a bit more through its paces. I think what I'll do is I'll assemble a project with this and see how it behaves. Uh, and then we can also have a look at the debug USB output as well and see what that offers. So don't forget to visit Axel's GitHub page. Don't forget to visit our sponsor for this video, PCBWay, and maybe even look at Axel's project page on the PCBWay website and maybe even order a PCB from there or through his Tindy link, which I'll put in the description down below. Hope you enjoyed the video and until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>